This is section 24 of The Complete Works of George Saville, First Marquis of Halifax. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Moral Thoughts and Reflections Read by John Greenman Of the World It is from the shortness of thought that men imagine there is any great variety in the world. Time hath thrown a veil upon the faults of former ages, or else we should see the same deformities we condemn in the present times. When a man looketh upon the rules that are made, he will think there can be no faults in the world, and when he looketh upon the faults, there are so many he will be tempted to think there are no rules. They are not to be reconciled otherwise than by concluding that which is called frailty is the incurable nature of mankind a man that understandeth the world must be weary of it and a man who doth not for that reason ought not to be pleased with it the uncertainty of what is to come is such a dark cloud that neither reason nor religion can quite break through it and the condition of mankind is to be weary of what we do know and afraid of what we do not the world is beholden to generous mistakes for the greatest part of the good that is done in it our vices and virtues couple with one another and get children that resemble both their parents if a man can hardly inquire into a thing he undervalueth how can a man of good sense take pains to understand the world to understand the world and to like it are two things not easily to be reconciled that which is called an able man is a great overvaluer of the world and all that belongeth to it all that can be said of him is that he maketh the best of the general mistake it is the fools and the knaves that make the wheels of the world turn they are the world those few who have sense or honesty sneak up and down single but never go in herds to be too much troubled is a worse way of overvaluing the world than the being too much pleased a man that steps aside from the world and hath leisure to observe it without interest or design thinks all mankind as mad as they think him for not agreeing with them in their mistakes of ambition the serious folly of wise men in overvaluing the world is as contemptible as anything they think fit to censure the first mistake belonging to business is the going into it men make it such a point of honor to be fit for business that they forget to examine whether business is fit for a man of sense there is reason to think the most celebrated philosophers would have been bunglers at business but the reason is because they despised it it is not a reproach but a compliment to learning to say that great scholars are less fit for business since the truth is business is so much a lower thing than learning that a man used to the last cannot easily bring his stomach down to the first the government of the world is a great thing but it is a very coarse one too compared with the fineness of speculative knowledge the dependence of a great man upon a greater is a subjection that lower men cannot easily comprehend ambition hath no mean it is either upon all four or upon tiptoes nothing can be humbler than ambition when it is so disposed popularity is a crime from the moment it is sought it is only a virtue where men have it whether they will or no it is generally an appeal to the people from the sentence given by men of sense against them it is stepping very low to get very high men by habit make irregular stretches of power without discerning the consequence and extent of them eagerness is apt to overlook consequences it is loath to be stopped in its career for when men are in great haste they see only in a straight line of cunning 
and knavery cunning is so apt to grow into knavery that an honest man will avoid the temptation of it but men in this age are half bribed by the ambition of circumventing without any other encouragements so proud of the character of being able men that they do not care to have their dexterity confined in this age when it is said of a man he knows how to live it may be implied he is not very honest an honest man must lose so many occasions of getting that the world will hardly allow him the character of an able one there is however more wit requisite to be an honest man than there is to be a knave the most necessary thing in the world and yet the least usual is to reflect that those we deal with may know how to be as arrant knaves as ourselves the eagerness of a knave maketh him often as catchable as ignorance maketh a fool no man is so much a fool as not to have wit enough sometimes to be a knave nor any so cunning a knave as not to have the weakness sometimes to play the fool the mixture of fool and knave maketh up the party-coloured creatures that make all the bustle in the world there is not so pleasant a quarry as a knave taken in a net of his own making a knave leaneth sometimes so hard upon his impudence that it breaketh and lets him fall knavery is in such perpetual motion that it hath not always leisure to look to its own steps tis like sliding upon skates no motion so smooth or swift but none gives so terrible a fall a knave loveth self so heartily that he is apt to overstrain it by never thinking he can get enough he gets so much less his thought is like wine that fretteth with too much fermenting the knaves in every government are a kind of corporation and though they fall out with one another like all beasts of prey yet upon occasion they unite to support the common cause it cannot be said to be such a corporation as the bank of england but they are a numerous and formidable body scarce to be resisted but the point is they can never rely upon one another knaves go chained to one another like slaves in the galleys and cannot easily untie themselves from their company their promises and honor indeed do not hinder them but other entangling circumstances keep em from breaking loose if knaves had not foolish memories they would never trust one another so often as they do present interest like present love maketh all other friendship look cold to it but it faileth in the holding when one knave betrayeth another the one is not to be blamed nor the other to be pitied when they complain of one another as if they were honest men they ought to be laughed at as if they were fools there are some cunning men who yet can scarce be called rational creatures yet they are often more successful than men of sense because those they have to deal with are upon a looser guard and their simplicity maketh their knavery unsuspected there is no such thing as a venial sin against morality no such thing as a small knavery he that carries a small crime easily will carry it on when it grows to be an ox but the little knaves are the greater of the two because they have less the excuse of temptation knavery is so humble and merit so proud that the latter is thrown down because it cannot stoop of folly and fools there are five orders of fools as of building one the blockhead two coxcomb three vain blockhead four grave coxcomb and five the half-witted fellow this last is of the composite order the follies of grave men have the precedence of all others a ridiculous dignity that gives them a right to be laughed at in the first place as the masculine wit is the strongest 
so the masculine impertinence is the greatest the consequence of a half-wit is a half-will there is not strength enough in the thought to carry it to the end a fool is naturally recommended to our kindness by setting us off by the comparison men are grateful to fools for giving them the pleasure of contemning them but folly hath a long tail that is not seen at first for every single folly hath a root out of which more are ready to sprout and a fool hath so unlimited a power of mistaking that a man of sense can never comprehend to what degree it may extend there are some fools so low that they are preferred when they are laughed at their being named putteth them in the list of men which is more than belongeth to them one should no more laugh at a contemptible fool than at a dead fly the dissimulation of a fool should come within the statute of stabbing it giveth no warning a fool will be rude from the moment he is allowed to be familiar he can make no other use of freedom than to be unmannerly weak men are apt to be cruel because they stick at nothing that may repair the ill effect of their mistakes folly is often more cruel in the consequence than malice can be in the intent many a man is murdered by the well-meant mistakes of his unthinking friends a weak friend if he will be kind ought to go no farther than wishes if he proffereth either to say or to do it is dangerous a man had as good go to bed to a razor as to be intimate with a foolish friend mistaken kindness is little less dangerous than premeditated malice a man hath not the relief of being angry at the blows of a mistaken friend a busy fool is fitter to be shut up than a downright madman a man that hath only wit enough not to do hurt committeth a sin if he aimeth at doing good his passive understanding must not pretend to be active it is a sin against nature for such a man to be meddling it is hard to find a blockhead so wise as to be upon the defensive he will be sallying and then he is sure to be ill-used if a dull fool can make a vow and keep it never to speak his own sense or do his own business he may pass a great while for a rational creature a blockhead is as ridiculous when he talketh as a goose is when it flieth the grating a gridiron is not a worse noise than the jingling of words is to a man of sense it is ill manners to silence a fool and cruelty to let him go on most men make little other use of their speech than to give evidence against their own understanding a great talker may be a man of sense but he cannot be one who will venture to rely upon him there is so much danger in talking that a man strictly wise can hardly be called a sociable creature the great expense of words is laid out in setting ourselves out or deceiving others to convince them requireth but a few many words are always either suspicious or ridiculous a fool hath no dialogue within himself the first thought carrieth him without the reply of a second a fool will admire or like nothing that he understands a man of sense nothing but what he understands wise men gain and poor men live by the superfluities of fools till follies become ruinous the world is better with than it would be without them a fool is angry that he is the fool of a knave forgetting that it is the end of his creation of hope hope is a kind cheat in the minute of our disappointment we are angry but upon the whole matter there is no pleasure without it it is so much a pleasanter thing than truth to the greatest part of the world that it hath all their kindness the other only hath their respect hope is generally a wrong guide though it is very good company by the way it brusheth through hedge and ditch till it cometh to a great leap and there it is apt to fall and break its bones 
it would be well if hopes carried men only to the top of the hill without throwing them afterwards down the precipice the hopes of a fool are blind guides those of a man of sense doubt often of their way men should do with their hopes as they do with tame fowl cut their wings that they may not fly over the wall a hoping fool hath such terrible falls that his brains are turned though not cured by them the hopes of a fool are bullets he throws into the air that fall down again and break his skull there can be no entire disappointment to a wise man because he maketh it a cause of succeeding another time a fool is so unreasonably raised by his hopes that he is half dead by a disappointment his mistaken fancy draweth him so high that when he falleth he is sure to break his bones of anger anger is a better sign of the heart than of the head it is a breaking out of the disease of honesty just anger may be as dangerous as it could be if there was no provocation to it for a knave is not so nice a casuist but that he will ruin if he can any man that blameth him where ill-nature is not predominant anger will be short-breathed it cannot hold out a long course hatred can be tired and cloyed as well as love for our spirits like our limbs are tired with being long in one posture there is a dignity in good sense that is offended and defaced by anger anger is never without an argument but seldom with a good one anger raiseth invention but it overheateth the oven anger like drink raiseth a great deal of unmannerly wit true wit must come by drops anger throweth it out in a stream and then it is not likely to be of the best kind ill language punisheth anger by drawing a contempt upon it of apologies it is a dangerous task to answer objections because they are helped by the malice of mankind a bold accusation doth at first draw such a general attention that it gets the world on its side to a man who hath a mind to find a fault an excuse generally giveth farther hold explaining is generally half confessing innocence hath a very short style when a jealousy of any kind is once raised it is as often provoked as cured by any arguments let them be never so reasonable when laziness letteth things alone it is a disease but when skill doth it it is a virtue malice may help a fool to aggravate but there must be skill to know how to extenuate to lessen an object that at the first sight giveth offence requireth a dexterous hand there must be strength as well as skill to take off the weight of the first impression when a man is very unfortunate it looketh like a saucy thing in him to justify himself a man must stoop sometimes to his ill star but he must never lie down to it the vindications men make of themselves to posterity would hardly be supported by good sense if they were not of some advantage to their own families the defending an ill thing is more criminal than the doing it because it wanteth the excuse of its not being premeditated an advocate for injustice is like a bawd that is worse than her client who committeth the sin there is hardly any man so strict as not to vary a little from truth when he is to make an excuse not telling all the truth is hiding it and that is comforting or abetting a lie a long vindication is seldom a skilful one long doth at least imply doubtful in such a case a fool should avoid the making an excuse as much as the committing a fault for a fool's excuse is always a second fault and whenever he will undertake either to hide or mend a thing he proclaimeth and spoileth it of malice and envy 
malice is a greater magnifying glass than kindness malice is of a low stature but it hath very long arms it often reacheth into the next world death itself is not a bar to it malice like lust when it is at the height doth not know shame if it did not sometimes cut itself with its own edge it would destroy the world malice can mistake by being keen as well as by being dull when malice groweth critical it loseth its credit it must go under the disguise of plainness or else it is exposed anger may have some excuse for being blind but malice none for malice hath time to look before it when malice is overgrown it cometh to be the highest degree of impertinence for that reason it must not be fed and pampered which is apt to make it play the fool but where it is wise and steady there is no precaution that can be quite proof against it ill will is seldom cured on a sudden it must go off by degrees by insensible transpiration malice may be sometimes out of breath envy never a man may make peace with hatred but never with envy no passion is better heard by our will than that of envy no passion is admitted to have audience with less exception envy taketh the shape of flattery and that maketh men hug it so close that they cannot part with it the sure way to be commended is to get into a condition of being pitied for envy will not give its leave to commend a man till he is miserable a man is undone when envy will not vouchsafe to look upon him yet after all envy doth virtue as much good as hurt by provoking it to appear nay it forcibly draweth out and inviteth virtue by giving it a mind to be revenged of it of vanity the world is nothing but vanity cut out into several shapes men often mistake themselves but they never forget themselves a man must not so entirely fall out with vanity as not to take its assistance in the doing great things vanity is like some men who are very useful if they are kept under and else not to be endured a little vanity may be allowed in a man's train but it must not sit down at table with him without some share of it men's talents would be buried like ore in a mine unwrought men would be less eager to gain knowledge if they did not hope to set themselves out by it it showeth the narrowness of our nature that a man that intendeth any one thing extremely hath not thought enough left for anything else our pride maketh us overvalue our stock of thought so as to trade much beyond what it is able to make good many aspire to learn what they can never comprehend as others pretend to teach what they themselves do not know the vanity of teaching often tempteth a man to forget he is a blockhead self-conceit driveth away the suspecting how scurvily others think of us vanity cannot be a friend to truth because it is restrained by it and vanity is so impatiently desirous of showing itself that it cannot bear the being crossed there is a degree of vanity that recommendeth if it goeth further it exposeth so much as to stir the blood to do commendable things but not so much as to possess the brain and turn it round there are as many that are blown up by the wind of vanity as are carried away by the stream of interest everybody hath not wit enough to act out of interest but everybody hath little enough to do it out of vanity some men's heads are as easily blown away as their hats if the commending others well did not recommend ourselves there would be few panegyrics men's vanity will often dispose them to be commended into very troublesome employments the desiring to be remembered when we are dead is to so little purpose 
that it is fit men should as they generally are be disappointed in it nevertheless the desire of leaving a good name behind us is so honorable to ourselves and so useful to the world that good sense must not be heard against it heraldry is one of those foolish things that may yet be too much despised the contempt of scutcheons is as much a disease in this age as the overvaluing them was in former times there is a good use to be made of the most contemptible things and an ill one of those that are the most valuable of money if men considered how many things there are that riches cannot buy they would not be so fond of them the things to be bought with money are such as least deserve the giving a price for them wit and money are so apt to be abused that men generally make a shift to be the worse for them money in a fool's hand exposeth him worse than a pied coat money hath too great a preference given to it by states as well as by particular men men are more the sinews of war than money the third part of an army must be destroyed before a good one can be made out of it they who are of opinion that money will do everything may very well be suspected to do everything for money false learning a little learning misleadeth and a great deal often stupefieth the understanding great reading without applying it is like corn heaped that is not stirred it groweth musty a learned coxcomb dieth his mistakes in so much a deeper colour a wrong kind of learning serveth only to embroider his errors a man that hath read without judgment is like a gun charged with goose shot let loose upon the company he is only well furnished with materials to expose himself and to mortify those he liveth with the reading of the greatest scholars if put into a limbeck might be distilled into a small quantity of essence the reading of most men is like a wardrobe of old clothes that are seldom used weak men are the worse for the good sense they read in books because it furnishes them only with more matter to mistake of company men that cannot entertain themselves want somebody though they care for nobody an impertinent fellow is never in the right but in his being weary of himself by that time men are fit for company they see the objections to it the company of a fool is dangerous as well as tedious it is flattering some men to endure them present punishment attendeth the fault a following wit will be welcome in most companies a leading one lieth too heavy for envy to bear outdoing is so near reproaching that it will generally be thought very ill company anything that shineth doth in some measure tarnish everything that standeth next to it keeping much company generally endeth in playing the fool or the knave with them of friendship friendship cometh oftener by chance than by choice which maketh it generally so uncertain it is a mistake to say a friend can be bought a man may buy a good turn but he cannot buy the heart that doth it friendship cannot live with ceremony nor without civility there must be a nice diet observed to keep friendship from falling sick nay there is more skill necessary to keep a friend than there is to reclaim an enemy those friends who are above interest are seldom above jealousy it is a misfortune for a man not to have a friend in the world but for that reason he shall have no enemy in the commerce of the world men struggle little less with their friends than they do with their enemies esteem ought to be the ground of kindness and yet there are no friends that seldomer meet kindness is apt to be as afraid of esteem as that is to be ashamed of kindness our kindness is greatest to those that will do what we would have them in which our esteem cannot always go along 
End of Moral Thoughts and Reflections Read by John Greenman